Welcome to Alt Swift X's A Clash of Kings. I mean, I mean, a cocker bridged. That's what we're called. Shit, look, it's been a while. We forgot what we're called, but we're going to work it out together. In a cocker bridge, we methodically, systematically dissect the text of A Clash of Kings, which is, of course, the second book in the Game of Thrones series. And look, it's it's been a little while since we've done one of these. I can understand if you don't quite recall what we were up to, uh, you know, because there's a lot to remember, you know? I mean, And this was a problem when the book came out as well, right? Like, remember that this is the second book, and it came two years after the first book. Two years for people to remember all these details of, of you know, who was lording over who, which kings were clashing, who was stabbing who, who was rooting who. There's all sorts of details to keep on, on, on track of. But, but, but the train of this story takes a little while to accelerate, so you can still hop on easily enough, I would say. Because in this first dozen chapters, uh, George Martin, he, he doesn't throw us in the deep end, he sort of gently reminds us of all the little who's who and, like, uh, what sort of themes are being explored, what kind of character arcs we can expect, and what to remember. Because it was t it was two years in between books one and two. How could, it, how could anyone wait two years between installments of Game of Thrones? It would be utterly unrealistic to make readers wait longer than two... Uh, Oh, 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 hang on. Oh, sorry, I've got... Uh, uh, my research team... Oh, uh, oh no. Oh, I've just... Alright, I've just had a piece of paper passed to me. Apparently, uh, there was two years in between the first and second book, and then there was two, two years between the second and third, but then there was five years in between the third and the fourth books, and then there was six years... People had to wait six years for the fifth book after the fourth, and and c correct me if I'm wrong, but it's been it's been over seven years in between book five and the forthcoming sixth. That uh, that's how's anyone going to remember what? How's I mean? Because the show's going to have been out, and like and and no one's going to oh. Oh no. Um <clears throat> But don't you worry, because look, we can we can just delve a little deeper into this chapter. We can just pass these sentences a little more meticulously, and no doubt we will find more meaning in this story. You just wait. You just uh, alright, we're rambling now. We're going to read this chapter. It's called John 1, A Clash of Kings, and it begins with John saying, Sam? Sam. I, I can't do... I wish I could do... So he says, he says Sam, because John is coming into the library looking for Samuel Tully. Um, and, the, and the library of Castle Black is described as smelling of paper and dust and years, which I think is a beautiful description. This library is dim. There's a faint yellow glow of candlelight lighting the leather-bound books and ancient scrolls. John doesn't want to risk an open flame amidst all this dry old paper. Um, and I think this space of books, this space of knowledge, the language that's used to describe it, gives a certain uncertainty and sort of vagary and shadows and, and unknowns. Knowledge uh, is, is, is very much a part of... Knowledge is the opposite to the unknown. Whenever there's ancient knowledge in Game of Thrones and ancient history and time and records, it's always associated with the, with the shadow of mystery and the unknown. George Martin is constantly emphasizing that anything that we know about the past, any kind of ancient history, is uncertain by nature, and these dusty, shadowy books uh, uh, represent that. It always, always fucks with me that, that, that knowledge was physical at a certain time as well. Like, 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 like knowledge was measured in kilograms. You could, you could have tonnage of facts. You could, you could, like, if you got one of those encyclopedia volumes, I mean, you could, you could crush a man between the weight of a Funkin' Wagnalls. Back in my day, warfare was conducted 
through knowledge in the most physical like we would load up the trebuchets with with some heavy thesauri and dictionary and we'd just fling them at the battlements and people would get killed by 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 volume 14 of the encyclopedia britannica that was how we conducted colonialism back in the day it was a wild time these days you can just pick up a smartphone and google up you know what how what's the dollar worth of cardi b's left bum cheek and like it'll just infinitely be delivered psychically right into your in into your face and it's amazing how it works these days is all i'm trying to say but game of thrones is very much rooted in that time of where, where knowledge is physical and knowledge is knowledge is mystical and kind of scary and samwise has a lot of respect and reverence for that that was that was the way it was back then you know you know about odin right oh dams in the chat says that trebuchets come from china there's a lot of, like, shit with it. I think people, like, always assume that, like, white people invented it and then they're like, yo, fireworks. Um, but, yeah, I don't really know about that. Um, anyway, so uh, we get Jon Snow described as being uh, dark of hair, long of face, grey of eye. Jon in the show is, of course, far too pretty uh, compared to the books. In the books, he's described... Well, I don't think they ever says he's ugly, but you don't get the sense from his long of face and his solemn features. It doesn't really uh, make you think Kit Harrington, does it? Um, but John is also described, I think, interestingly, as a shadow among shadows, which is literally sense in this dim, dark library. But I think that also kind of encapsulates, deliberately or otherwise, uh, the nature of John, John's arc... Um, because John is, John is, John is, John is the outsider, John is solemn, John is a night's watchman clad in black, and he's often surrounded by the mystical apocalyptic dangers of uh, the world of A Song of Ice and Fire. He's fighting wildlings, and he's fighting the White Walkers, and he goes far beyond the north, and he dies, of course. John battles darkness and he is a dark figure and i think that contrasts maybe with like daenerys who is this bright fiery figure out in like the bright exotic east um daenerys is a bright figure while john is dark and there's maybe a sort of yin yang to that um so john also is injured remember last uh, book and season uh, john burned his hand because he was fighting zombies and he was learning the hard way that fire kills zombies uh, and as such he burned his hand thereby incidentally proving that he's not a zombie if john was a zombie he would have burned by the fire uh so uh, so it's always good to know that you're not one of the undead if you're ever in doubt i don't recommend self-conflagration um, but, but all I'm saying is that, that famous shot of the Tibetan monk, you, at least you know he's not a zombie. That's, all right, anyway. Um, so, also, I, the thing I love about that is that it broods on the consequences of John's injuries. Like, I've complained about this many times before, but, like, it, it, I, it, it's always dumb when characters in any kind of fiction just like get beaten in the face a million times and then they just don't care and they just keep on walking it's like what was what why did you waste our time with with the beating of the face bit and it and it leads to this uh like arms race like heightening there's a better term for it but like like in order to up the violence of previous episodes you need to make it progressively more violent until by season six you got Jon Snow punching Ramsay in the face like 28 times I counted and Ramsay survives and it's like what violence is only meaningful to us as an audience if it has tangible consequences to the characters who are on the receiving end of it and so that's why i like that we are repeatedly reminded that john's hand was burned and we experience some of the pain he has from that and the healing process it's great to see the consequences of violence um uh, so samuel tarley is in the library and sam uh sam uh He's studying, he's reading all these books because Jor Mormont is leading the rangers beyond the north, beyond the wall, out to fight the wildlings. Uh, and to do that, Jor Mormont needs maps, uh, and maps will be found in the Castle Black Library. Uh, and so that's why Sam's been here looking for books and things. Uh, and Sam has apparently been here all night because he didn't break his fast with the other watchmen. 
Um, and they thought he might have deserted the Night's Watch, except that would require courage, and Sam has no courage. Um, so they are, um, they are suggesting here, that they are alluding to Sam's whole sort of character thing of him being a coward and trying to face his cowardice, uh, and later on he becomes Sam the Slayer and he sort of proves himself, although there's perhaps other ways that Sam might be able to prove himself, uh, perhaps through books and knowledge, but we'll get to that. Um... Oh yeah, and and so Sam is sort of startled to learn that oh he's been he's been reading here all night. He didn't notice um, that that uh, that it had become dark and and then morning again. Um, and and it is kind of ironic that in this place of knowledge, uh, he says that there's no way to know that it's it's been all night. But yeah, fucking whatever. All right, so that that's page one. <clears throat> Turn in the page. Uh, so John calls Sam a sweet fool, uh, which is something for the shippers to get on, and John says, you're gonna miss that bed when we're sleeping on cold hard ground, because John and Sam are joining Dior Mormons ranging beyond the wall very soon. Um, and Sam is not too keen on the ranging bit, but he is very excited by this library. The books, he says, there are thousands, have you ever seen their like? Um... And at this moment, you've got to be reminded of that moment in season uh, six, when Sa- six? six, when Sam goes to the Citadel Library and there's this crazy, unrealistic, like, multi-story, just ultimate uh, uber apotheosis of libraries, like Stephen King might say. Just this mega library with a bajillion books in, a, in the Citadel. Uh, and Sam marvels at that. And, and here he is marveling at the thousands of books in the Castle Black Library. And John mentions the library at Winterfell, which has more than a hundred books. Um, and tragically, we know that the library of Winterfell is actually burned the previous, uh, the previous book uh, by the cat's paw who tries to kill Bran Stark. Um, so like, uh, like Alexandria, the, the Winterfell library is burned. Um... And it's kind of funny that John doesn't know that that's happened. Um, he doesn't know that the library's been burned. He doesn't have knowledge of the loss of knowledge caused by the burning of the library. Anyway, so Sam uh, Sam is described as having fingers plump as sausages, which I think is a gross. <laughs> it's a gross uh, metaphor simile. I always imagine just these like fat hot dogs with like fingernails on them, and maybe some sort of articulated joints, like some sort of, like, salad fingers monstrosity. I I think food descriptions uh, should not be mixed with body descriptions, generally. Uh, But George Martin has got to pack those food descriptions in there somehow, so uh, there there we have it. Uh, And Sam is going over all the maps that he found, all these old maps of the lands beyond the wall, Uh, but he's more excited by all of the histories and mysteries and secrets that are alluded to in some of these texts. Uh, He finds this old text by someone who uh, went beyond the wall and found giants and traded with the children of the forest and all of these mystical creatures in the past of Westeros. Um, So there's always this association. Any kind of ancient books and knowledge is always associated with the mysticism of Westeros. It's like the further back you go from the present, the more magical everything becomes, which might partly be to do with, you know, the the decline of magic is a theme in in the story. There physically literally is less magical shit going on, like a sort of a background radiation that you can detect. It's, it's, It's on the decline. Like in Middle Earth, magic is leaving Middle Earth. Um... But at the same time as they're literally being less magic, I think there's also this effect of due to the hearsay and the fuzziness of ancient history, uh, more magic seeps in just just as a result of the vagary of history. Like there wasn't necessarily actual magic. People just uh, tell these mythologized legends of the way things were. These fairy tales like old Nan tells Bran. So like there, there was literally more magic back then, but there was also exaggeration and falsity. So we can't really be sure what the truth of the past is. Um, and then John's like, oh, yo, Sam, if you like books so much, you should write a book about our ranging beyond the wall, which, which surely has got a hint that, you know, at the end of the season, at the end of the series, Sam is going to sit down and start writing A Song of Ice and Fire, just like 
Frodo does and Bilbo do, do about the the Lord of the Rings. Um, it, it it's 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 been done, but it's always fun to have uh, a book series turn out to be written by one of the characters. Um, although that means that Samwell described his own dick as a fat pink mast, uh, which raises more questions than it answers. Um, anyway, so Sam is really excited by all of these books, he's scared about the ranging tomorrow, um, and he says that, you know, I, if I could just stay in this library for longer, I could sort out all these books, because a lot of them are, like, falling apart, and they need to be organized, and, you know, there aren't very many literate, studious men at the Night's Watch to sort all this shit out. It takes work to maintain a library, especially a physical one, uh, and Sam, Sam says, I could do this so well, but, but he's being dragged off. Uh, to the to the ranging and of course that suggests that Sam uh, surely at the end of the series if Sam survives a great ending for Sam's character would be for him to get to sort out a bunch of old books perhaps at the Citadel Sam has of course just arrived at the Citadel although if the books if the shows any indication it's not apparent whether uh, Sam is really going to get uh, to do as much fun stuff in the Citadel as he's li- as he'd like. He's a bit too busy scrubbing latrines in the show. Uh, we'll see what happens in the books. In the books, Sam has just recently arrived at the Citadel. Um, Jared suggests that maybe Sam just writes the fan fiction and Gilly writes the books. Um, I-, I do like how-, how Sam teaches Gilly to write uh, in the show. Does that happen in the books as well? I don't recall if that happens... I'm not sure. I, G- Gilly's... Yeah. All right. Um, so they're discussing the books, um, and, uh, and yeah, Sam mentions how some of these old books have been copied half a hundred times. That is wild. The idea that, like, you'd write a book, you'd spend, you know, hours, days, years writing a tome, and then, like, it will just physically degrade in however many decades, and you, you had these 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 monks and the and these and these and these students who who would just literally just sit down and just copy a book they just they just write by rote every word that's in another book just so that this book can survive for another cycle of printing then degradation which is just crazy and of course you know if something's been copied over a hundred times you get a bit of chinese whispers right like there's gonna be errors and omissions that creep in like the bible has a lot of this crazy history where like these manuscripts have been like copied over time and you know there are accidents and changes and mistranslations not to mention editorial changes when some monk is like oh wouldn't it be cool if like jesus had a jetpack in this verse um all sorts of stuff could change and you don't know what's real and what's not um so yeah, and maybe that's happened to a song of ice and fire. Maybe, uh, may- maybe the White Walkers are actually just 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 frosty, frosty old men, uh, who steal babies. Ma- who knows? Let's turn the page. Oh, but also, like it is, it is, it is wild that like these these people had to copy books. But like, and, and you know, the idea of the degradation of knowledge in like a physical sense is really crazy. Um, but like that happens on the internet now as well. There is this issue of like link rot when like you know you save a link to somewhere, but then websites go down. You know, servers die, people stop paying their domain registration, stuff gets taken down, censored, changed, destroyed. The internet still has a physicality behind it, and that still leads to to, to to information loss. There are whole organizations dedicated to trying to fight uh, this degradation and to preserve knowledge. And you know, and there's new issues as well, like 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 file formats. Like if you're saving all of your data um, in 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 you know MP3s and JPEGs and and docs and docxs and 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 other stuff, you never know when some new standard is going to come out. Everyone's going to start using different software, and then people are going to forget how to open a PDF. You know, um, data gets lost and it's scary not to mention not to mention just like the sheer scale of it right like all these statistics all these statistics about like the number of exabytes of data generated every day like 90 percent of which are like are like uh selfies and like like what what happens to all that physical i don't know man we need we need sam tarley we need like a digital sam tarley a sort of a internet gardener to sort of just manage and sort out all this stuff before it withers away knowledge yo anyway so sam describes some of the things uh that are listed in some of these documents in the uh night's watch castle black library he says that uh well he finds one that's basically a shopping list 
Uh, it's it, it lists pickled cod and fish oil and cask of salt and 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 you know like 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 double A batteries and and tampons and milk and it's just it's just a bunch of like mundane stuff. Um, and Sam's like, who, and and John is like, who cares how much pickled cod they ate six hundred years ago? Um, why is this relevant? But then Sam, with with the mind of an academic. Uh, says, oh, well, you know, you can learn a lot from a shopping list. You can learn, um, you can learn whether people shopped at Walmart or, or, or at Whole Foods, and you can learn, uh, whether they liked Twinkies, uh, or, or, or choc choco pies. Uh, you and, and that's like a real thing, like, like real anthropologists and stuff, um, go through some of these seemingly meaningless mundane archaeological records and learn real things about the way ancient peoples lived. Sometimes that's all we have. Sometimes with these ancient civilizations, there are so scant few scraps that we know about these people, and we've got to just 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 make informed guesses based on these little bits and pieces. Terry T in the chat suggests that maybe pickled cod kills White Walkers. Uh, honestly, it's worth a shot. Um, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, Sam, uh, defends the value of, of miscellaneous texts, um, and, and John is dubious. Uh, he says that, eh, I, I, I don't really see the value of this stuff. Um, and so, and so, and I think that's really suggesting that uh, Jon Snow could learn the value of books later. I think, I think Sam could prove to John, um, what the value of books and knowledge are. And and surely, you know, one of the ways that, that could happen is in defeating the White Walkers. Like Terry mentioned, you know, the idea of learning about Valyrian steel uh, or or, or uh, dragon glass as a, as a weapon against the White Walkers is something that basically has already happened in the show. So maybe John will learn to appreciate Sam's valuing of old texts through, like, the, the War for the Dawn or Prophecy or, or whatever the fuck. Um, but it'll probably be a long while before John ever appreciates a good novel. Some people are pragmatic, you know? Some people don't appreciate fiction all that much, and that's not something you can necessarily change. Some people are grounded in the real world, uh, which is, you know, good for them. Uh, but, you know, there, there are others, and they're cool too. Uh, anyway, so uh, the fat boy blurts something. Uh, it's mentioned that Sam is older than John, but a man grown by law. So I believe Sam is uh, 16 at the moment, and John is 15, which is, of course, kind of uh, ludicrous. Um, <laughs> Das is in the chat. Um, and I really shouldn't be lecturing people on uh, on history and archaeology when Hadass is in the room. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I ask her about uh, rocks. Uh, anyway, so um, they talk about the tongue of the children of the forest, old Valyria, the counts of the seasons. These are all some of the secrets and mysticism and, and, and important shit that's in some of these old books. And the seasons, by the way, are, of course, fucked and just ridiculous. Um, the idea that, you know, sometimes winter is 10 years long and sometimes it's one year long. Like, how does an environment and a, and a biome and, 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 and a civilization survive through that kind of madness? And how do they count time, by the way? Are they just really good at astronomy? There's lots of confusing questions about the seasons. Um, but uh, Sam thinks they're pretty dope. And they also keep on alluding to, like, the danger of the ranging that's coming. Uh, so, like, John says, oh, the books will all be here when we return from the ranging, and Sam says, oh, if we return, so there's this constant sort of foreboding sense of danger. So, you know, uh, George Martin is doing a lot of sort of reminding us of basic details in this uh, chapter, but he's also trying to keep us keep us awake by keeping on reminding us that, oh, there's danger coming, there's, there's tension for our characters, don't you worry about that, we're gonna get into some exciting fighting any moment now. Um, but for now, it's mostly just sort of exposition, honestly, but it's pretty decent exposition. And anyway, so we describe the ranging. There are hundreds of Night's Watchmen, uh, like 300 uh, Night's Watchmen are marching north. And it's crazy hearing these numbers of how many and how strong the Night's Watch was at this point, because, of course, by the later books, after, like, the battles between the Wildlings and the Watchmen and the Whites and the Watchmen, uh, the Night's Watch becomes uh, very vulnerable indeed. They have far fewer men in the later books and seasons, and so seeing how strong they were back then is like, uh, you know, damn. Uh, it's like seeing a photo of yourself when you're in your 20s and you had, you know, pecs the size of volleyballs, and you're like, man... Uh, 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 wistful, yo. 
Uh, and so we have a description of... Uh, John says that, like, oh, you'll be totally safe on the ranging, Sam. You'll be totally fine uh, because you'll be with all these strong blokes. And, of course, all these strong blokes are about to be slaughtered on the fist of the first man. But anyway... And John's like, oh, you'll be just as safe as you were in your father's castle at Horn Hill. Uh, which Sam says, well, I was actually never very safe in my father's castle either. Because, of course, Sam has this tragic, horrific backstory of his father, Randall, being very cruel and doing all these nasty things to Sam to try and toughen him up because he didn't like his son being a uh, effeminate. Well, not even effeminate, just sort of like a weak, uh, not very military, not very physical, not very strong man. Uh, and, because, yeah, Sam is the self-proclaimed coward, grossly fat, timid, and bad at riding, and bad at a sword, and yet here he is going out to the ranging. And the reason they're taking, uh, Sam on the ranging, uh, is because someone needs to look after the ravens, uh, because ravens are, of course, the Westerosi equivalent of emails. They carry messages around the realm, so people can know what's up, what the latest goss is. It was the equivalent of Facebook likes. Um, and normally Maester Amon is the one who keeps the ravens, but Maester Amon is a hundred years old and blind, and therefore not very well suited to a, uh, little tundra, tu little frolic through the tundra, L little, little bit of a hop, skip, and jump through the, through the frost fangs, uh, really, uh, Amon's wheelhouse at the moment. So that's Sam's responsibility. Uh, and, and at the thought of that responsibility, Sam's chins quiver. Uh, and John is the old bear's steward, and he'll be busy looking after Gior Mormont because he's grooming you for command. Uh, that, uh, I can't do accents. Um, because Gior Mormont wants John to be the next Lord Commander, uh, and so that's what John's role means as steward. Uh, and Sam's like, but I'm so scared, I'm so scared of going beyond the wall, and John says we're all scared. Uh, and of course, Ned Stark last book reminded us that we can only be brave when we are afraid. Uh, so despite their fear, they march on. And that's what makes John and Sam heroic. Uh, heroic, but a bit a bit wimpy and complainy in Sam's case. Uh, we're reminded that John's uncle Benjamin Stark is somewhere beyond the wall. Don't know where. Uh, and, uh, there are corpses that rose in the night last book, we know that. Jaffa Flowers and Othor tried to, were these Night's Watchmen who were killed, but they rose as zombies and John killed them with fire. Um, and John still sees the white in his dreams coming at him with blue eyes and cold black hands. Uh, whites, the zombies in the books, are really scary, like, individually and even and even in the show like John's fight against Othor in in season 1 like an individual white was pretty scary and pretty tough um and like John you know ran the zombie through with his sword uh and and it and it kept on fighting uh and by now in the show in like season 7 these whites are like some World War Z shit like these just this tide of undead little boogans who just get shattered to bits of mush the moment, you know, Sandor sneezes vigorously at one of them. Uh, the, the, the whites are individually not very scary in the show anymore, and I think they actually kind of have an excuse uh, in the show, because a lot of those, like, armies of the dead, like, they are very old corpses who have been marching around for a long time, and so it makes sense to me that their body has degraded more, and therefore they're more physically vulnerable. So I guess it's okay that a lot of the, a lot of those zombies are um, are uh, pretty easy to take down. Uh, but still, like, it's, it's, it's a really stark contrast between the, the individually scary zombies of book and season one, and the just cannon fodder of, uh, of the later show. I, I, I do wonder how the books will handle the whites later in the series. Like, will they be still individually scary, or will we just have these massive tides like World War Z? Uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, so, oh uh, yeah, and so John says again that, yeah, look, we're scared, but there's no shame in fear. What matters is how we face it. Uh, and I think that Mewtwo said it best. Mewtwo said, uh, it doesn't matter how your, the circumstances of your birth are not what define you. It's what you do with the gift of life. It's your choices, it's your decisions, it's your actions. That, that's what makes you, that's what defines you. That's what, that's what the difference between heroism and villainy. And that struggle is what A Song of Ice and Fire is largely about. Um, so, 
Sam nods unhappily, uh, and yet he persists. Uh, and so they leave the library, and they mention the worm walks, which are like these uh, underground tunnels uh, that link the various buildings at Castle Black. So during the winter, when the snow piles dozens of feet deep, um, the the Night's Watchmen move through the worm walks instead of like above ground uh, at Castle Black, a subterranean where it is snug. Um, and I can't help but be reminded of George R. R. Martin's short story House of the Worm, uh, with all this talk of worm walks, um, because um, because it's just a really fucked up story. Like, have you heard of this? Like, like George R. R. Martin, author of Game of Thrones, wrote this really fucked up. He's written lots of weird fucked up short stories but this one in particular is about like this post-apocalyptic like society of people who worship worms and they have like these priests who cut off all of their own limbs in order to resemble the worms that they worship and there's just this real and it's about this person who goes down into the blind dark deep and there's all this like weird post-apocalyptic history that he learns and these like warring subspecies and, and Preston Jacobs has all these theories and it's 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 worth a read House of the Worm check it uh but the but we're reminded of winter we're reminded of the coming winter when the snows fall and the ice winds come howling winter is coming so we're being reminded of all the di- all of the different uh dangers in this story um so uh and we have talk of summer like john snow had seen a summer once when he was very young but it was only a, a short one and a mild one the real winter is coming, and John can feel it in his bones. Uh, and they go up some steep stone steps that have Sam puffing like a bellows. And it has been said, but it is it is crazy uh, that Sam remains so fat through the whole series, despite the amount of cardio he's doing with the ranging beyond the wall. Um, he can barely handle these steps, and yet he's about to go on this giant trek uh, across across the tundra, and that... You know, that ain't, that, that ain't, that ain't science. Um, and then Ghost, John's direwolf, is hanging out. Uh, and uh, and when John approaches the direwolf, uh, Ghost wakes up. He had been asleep, but he suddenly wakes up when John approaches. And there's a couple of ways to interpret that. You could say that, well, uh, Ghost just heard the noise of John's footsteps or something, and that's what woke him up. But what might be the case is that the psychic connection between John and his direwolf. Remember, John is a warg. He can enter the mind of his direwolf, just like all of the Stark kids can in the books. Uh, so maybe it's that psychic connection that alerts Ghost and makes him wake up. Because there's actually a lot of moments in uh, book five, especially, when John straight up, like, hears what Ghost hears and smells what Ghost smells, and they share emotions and stuff. So I think it's entirely plausible uh, that uh, Ghost is actually warg woken by John's mind as opposed to sound. Uh, Next page. uh, Sam squints up at the wall. (laughs) It's fun. It's, it's, look, it's interesting writing because like what we're seeing here is the way George R. R. Martin is, is, is just methodically going through and just reminding us of here are all of the things that's happening in the North. Uh, there's the ranging, uh, and there's there's the whites. There's the threat of the of the zombies that was mentioned last season. We're reminded of what Sam's character's about, what John's character's about. We're reminded of the winter. We're reminded of the wall. So this is so this is like you know, and it doesn't feel like it. Like it's still a story, and it still flows. Um, but George R. R. Martin is basically giving us like a previously on is basically what this chapter is. Just reminding us of what's going on at this point in the story. Uh, and so we're reminded of what the wall is. It's, it looms above like an icy cliff, 700 feet high. Um, and for those who use real uh, uh, measures of measurement, uh, that's 200 meters, uh, which is, of course, absurd. I think George Martin has said that uh, the, the height of the wall, the scale of things, is silly. Um, but, but we get this description of the wall, which emphasizes the sort of like mystical, incredible quality of it. The color of the ice changes with every shift of the light. It stretches east and west as far as the eye can see. This is the end of the world and we are going beyond it. So if you're into Joseph Campbell, this is a very, (laughs) very literal threshold which John is crossing. He's entering the world of magic, leaving his uh, normal, familiar world behind. Um, And we have a description of the weather, but also the comet, the red comet streaking across the sky. It's so cool how all the different characters and places 
in this uh, second book interpret this comet in different ways. Uh, so, uh, so the Night's Watchmen are interpreting this comet as Mormont's torch, saying that the gods have sent it to light the way uh, for Lord Mormont through the haunted forest. So everyone interprets this comet in a way that's relevant to their lives. Um, and Sam looks up and says, oh, look how bright the comet is. But John says, never mind about comets. I only care about maps. So again, like John is being very sort of pragmatic and he's dismissive of the mystical, which is kind of funny and, and maybe ironic because, of course, John is intimately connected to the mystical and the prophetic. Uh, this comet is quite possibly the, the bleeding red star, which which uh, prophesies the emergence of Azora High, the hero to save the world, which is probably John. So it's funny that Sam's like, oh, look at all this cool magic shit, and John's like, oh, I don't believe in magic, when he's like the most magical boy in all the land. Um, so that's silly. Uh, and so they talk about the brothel in Molestown. Uh, so Molestown is this little, little town uh, south of the wall, uh, where it's called Molestown because it's like mostly underground uh, because it's so goddamn cold. And a lot of the Night's Watchmen go to the brothel before the ranging because if they're going to go and freeze and fight for friggin' weeks, uh, they might as well get laid first. So they go to that brothel. And of course, uh, you know, John refuses to go to the brothel because he took a vow uh, to not do such things, not to fraternize uh, or wear crowns or hold land or any of those things. Um, so he's like the, the, you know, the one stickler in the office who actually follows the rule of like, you know, not, not, uh, stealing office stationery or what it's like that in like almost every institution, like from the outside, it seems like, oh, they've got their shit together. People probably follow the rules. There's procedure, there's flow charts. But when you actually get inside and a part of an institution, you realize that now nah, everyone's just fucking like this. They're, they're stealing donuts. Like don't even worry about it just make sure you know the boss doesn't see and the boss th themselves is probably stealing as many donuts as anyone so it's it's all it's all donuts um that marx said that um and so john took his vow uh, and they also passed the sept they didn't include that in the show but the, but the but castle black has a sept a, a temple to the faith of the seven which is basically game of thrones catholicism and john observes that some men want whores on the eve of battle and some want gods i would suggest pequeno los dos they're not they're not incompatible in fact there was that scene in the show uh when we saw we saw the high septon you know the pope of game of thrones at one of Littlefinger's brothels being entertained by a number of prostitutes who were dressed up as the various gods of the faith of the seven the maid the crone the warrior the smith the the stranger the other ones um and it was quite hilarious like all these costumes of these prostitutes as different gods or goddesses circling uh, and uh, and you know that my point is that that is a combination of gods and whores so maybe the high septon was being uh just quite creative and, and progressive i think he should be applauded for his creativity uh but the sparrows in season five did not agree um okay so welcome smashed avo to the chat it is indeed stream time uh, and so Andrew Tarth, oh no, and John also mentions the old gods, because of course John follows the old gods of the forest and the children of the forest, and by the way, the old gods are secretly a psychic network that eats people, but don't worry about that right now. Um, and we mentioned Sir Andrew Tarth is the master at arms at Castle Black now, since we got rid of, um, what's his face, Alistair Thorne, uh, and Andrew Tarth, of course, being, being a Tarth, must be related to Brienne of Tarth, um, and we don't know what the relationship is, but but I wonder I wonder if Andrew Tarth takes after Brienne. I wonder if Andrew is giant and strong like Brienne is. There's no indication as such in the text. But anyway, there are some new recruits to the Night's Watch being trained by uh, Andrew. Um, there's there's some brothers and a man with a club foot and and, and a grinning loon who must have fancied himself a warrior because most of the recruits to the Night's Watch are just like uh, rabble taken out of dungeons and and you know poor folk you know expendable people. Um, one of the people, uh, well, no, and, and what I'm suggesting is that maybe this grinning loon is someone who actually was insane enough to join the Night's Watch voluntarily, might have been laboring under the delusion that the Night's Watch is actually some kind of heroic and well-funded institution, rather than what's effectively a penal colony. 
like uh, like uh, like Australia. Uh, you know, no, no greater hive of scum and villainy than the Antipodes. My ma used to say, um, she she was she was murdered by um, Australian wildlife. Uh, but a pack of wombats crept up on her in the night and and cleft her in twain. We had to hold four separate burials for the four separate parts of my ma, um, which, which first had to be retrieved from the wombats. Of course, the Great Wombat Hunt of 38, we called it. Me and my cousins all rode up and we, uh, we, we scoured the outback for, um, for those, for those demon bats, th those, those womble spawn that came and cleft my ma, uh, and, and, and we, we, we found my mother's bits in the wombats and we dined on wombat for the next month. And with every bite of this grease dripping wombat haunch, I, 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 I loved the taste, but I, but I just, I shed a tear for my, for my late ma. <clears throat> uh, and so Andrew Tarth is doing his thing, uh, and John also meets Donal Noy. Uh, Donal Noy is, of course, a straight G. Uh, Donal Noy is a blacksmith who made uh, Bobby Baratheon's Warhammer, the famous Warhammer with which uh, Robert Baratheon slew Rhaegar Targaryen on, on, the, on the Battle of the Trident. That hammer was made by Donal Noy, straight G. Donal Noy has only one arm because he lost one during the Storm of Siege and uh, st Storm, Siege of Storm, you get it. Um, and and he's, just, he's just a great dude by all accounts. And in the books, he's killed by a giant... Uh, a giant under the wall, um, and uh, that's about the coolest way you can possibly go down. Um, and uh, and yeah, you know, a one top bloke. John likes him. Uh, Donald Noy last season uh, gave John a really stern talking to, um, and basically said, you know, pull up your fucking knickers and be a man, mate. Um, and as a result, John stopped being such a twat last. Uh, last book. So Donald Noy is a straight, straight. He's great. Uh, Glider suggests that he ate his own arm. Well, there's no, there's no proof to the contrary. Donald Noy is also the cook, isn't he? No, that's a different guy. Well, look, don't worry about it. Donald Noy is great. Um, so anyway, uh, defend the realms of men with a barber, a beggar, two orphans, and a boy whore. Oh, I forgot to mention Saturn. So one of the new recruits uh, to the Night's Watch is a foppish youth in soiled satin. Uh, we later get to know this character as uh, Saturn, named after what he wears. That's why they call me Denim. You should have, you should have known, me and the cousins back in the day, we were all named after our clothes, like Saturn. So we had, um, we had, um, who do we have? We had uh, uh, cor Corduroy, uh, Corduroy Clementine uh, was one cousin, and we had uh, Denim Dan, uh, and they had, uh, and they had Silky Steve. Uh, those, uh, those were all, and, and, and latex, uh, Letitia, uh, and, um, and Cotton Clive. Those were my cousins. That was who went on the wombat hunt. I tell you, we, gods, we were strong back in those days. Um, anyway, uh, so, uh, so Saturn, is, yeah, Saturn is who John eventually makes his steward later on. Uh, but, but now Saturn is merely a foppish youth. He was a prostitute, a boy prostitute, a catamite, Bowen Marsh calls him, uh, before he joined the Night's Watch. Uh, and so Andrew Tarth is, is training some of these recruits, uh, and Donal Noy is about, uh, and they discuss the news of John's brother Rob, because of course last book Rob was crowned king in the north, um, and this is deeply, personally, a big deal to John, uh, because, of course, Rob is his brother, but only his half-brother, because, uh, Rob is the son of Ned Stark and Catelyn Tully, whereas John believes himself to be the son of Ned and someone else, which makes him a bastard, and so, and so there's this difference between John and Rob. John and Rob, uh, like each other, and, and they have a great relationship, and they farewelled each other fondly, last book, but there's a definite undercurrency of jealousy and division, because Rob will be a king, like, even before that, he was going to be a lord, he was the, he was the heir of, of Ned Stark, whereas John, as a bastard, could not hold that position, and that's why he's in the watch, so there's this division and this resentment, uh, which kind of defines 
John, as part of what makes him this shadow amongst shadows, is that he's this sort of outsider condemned to not not be in the light like his true-born brother is. Um, so John reflects that uh, while John is is sucking snow melt from cupped hands on the ranging, Rob will sip summer wine from a jeweled goblet. Which, of course, is not strictly true. Rob will be a bit too busy warring and fighting the Lannisters, and when uh, I think Rob is a sort of an upstart bloke who wouldn't... Upstanding gentleman who wouldn't be in, enjoying luxury wine while while there's a war to fight, but um, there you go. Yeah, Kenny points out that, in the chat, points out that uh, John wanted to hate Rob, but he couldn't. Because Rob really is, a, is a quite a decent bloke. And maybe that's why Rob didn't have a POV character. I mean, George, uh, a POV chapters uh because in this book uh george martin writes from the point of view of a whole cast of characters rob is not one of them uh he has said that he doesn't want to give povs to kings uh for some reason um but but rob is maybe just not all that interesting of a character to be worth a pov i mean i'm sure if george martin made rob a pov he, he would he would complicate rob as a character perhaps um, but Rob, you know, he's basically just like a decent person who struggles and basically kind of succeeds at, at upholding the responsibilities of being a king and such. I don't know if, I don't know what we'd learn by, by having his POV, apart from whether, well, apart from what his relationship was with his direwolf, Grey Wind, that might have been interesting, but I digress. <clears throat> Um, and so they talk about that gossip and they talk about... Uh, how cool Donald Noy is. Uh, and Donald Noy says that King Robert, Robert Baratheon, he was never the same after he put on that crown, and he wonders how Rob's power will change him. Uh, so, so, so the relationship between power and, and people is, of course, one of the primary preoccupations of this series. How does power change people? How do people handle power? Um, what kind of people handle it well and that's kind of part of what Rob's story is like but anyway let's turn the page uh and so Donald Noy talks about the Baratheon brothers he has a quote here which is oft discussed amongst Game of Thrones nerds Donald Noy says Robert was the true steel Stannis is pure iron black and hard and strong yes but brittle the way iron gets he'll break before he bends and Renly, that one, he's copper. Bright and shiny, pretty to look at, but not worth all that much at the end of the day. So, Donald Noy here is suggesting that Robert Baratheon is a great bloke, he's strong, he's good, A+, plus, whereas Stannis is iron, he's too rigid and brittle, so he'll break. Uh, he's inflexible, he's always following rules all the time, the bloody nerd. Whereas Renly, he's just a princely, pronsly prancer who doesn't really get anything done, um, but he's he's pretty and he's charismatic and whatever. Um, and and fans of Stannis, uh, Stan Stans, as they like to be called, uh, they 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 disagree with Donald Noy quite passionately. Some of them. Uh, some people argue that Stannis, in fact. Uh, displays a lot of flexibility in his arc, uh, like the way that he works with the Northmen. He goes up to the north, Stannis does, this this foreign land to Stannis, um, and he pretty successfully puts in a lot of work to win over Northmen and to take on some of their customs and to listen to different p points of view. I mean, he, li he, he brings on a priestess of a shy, for Christ's sake. He, he, he becomes an agent of R'hllor. Like, Stannis is flexible and he does change his strategies a lot in a lot of different ways so some fans argue that Donald Noy is wrong about Stannis but you know that's that's Stan stands for you um uh, and uh and yeah Renly perhaps people don't disagree as much there are there are a lot of different opinions on Renly but um he, he certainly doesn't succeed in his goals um so copper perhaps um, but the point is, what metal is Rob? We're asking what kind of man is Rob and what will he reveal himself to be uh, in the coming books? Um, and what kind of person will John reveal himself to be? These are the sorts of questions that we're asking at the beginning of this second book. Um, and they think about, John thinks about how it's sort of a rule, an unspoken rule, of the Night's Watch, that you don't talk about politics. It's like Thanksgiving dinner. You don't talk about politics, you don't talk about religion, you don't talk about Twitter, um, because it just raises divisions that get in the way. 
Uh, it's easier to see everyone as a brotherhood who are undivided by such things. But the truth is that however many oaths a man swears, old loves and loyalties are not easily forgotten. So that's one of these tensions where the Night's Watch is trying to be honourable and neutral, but in fact, neutrality is impossible. So that's one of the sort of conflicts that will continue to be explored this chapter is between like duty and love, the passions that define us as people and the pragmatic necessity of following rules and principles. That's the division. Um, and in a way, like you can argue that, 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 that killing the boy and, and following honor and following rules, it can get shit done, but ultimately it's the passions that make life worth living in the first place. What is the point of honor and rules if not to perpetuate our ability to live and love? Uh, so neutrality is, is this, 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 this gray neutral zone of just following rules and doing the right thing. As John learns with Yeager, it sometimes it's, it's the, the point of honor is love, perhaps. Uh, and that division is explored throughout the series. Uh, yeah, it's, it's dehumanizing. That's what I'm trying to get at. All this rule following and all this honor doing and all this being a part of a brotherhood, like it's great, but by sacrificing your own personal passions for the sake of the collective, you'll, you, you lose your individual humanity. Um, but if you follow your own individual humanity and your individual needs too much, it's a disaster for everyone. No one can get shit done if everyone's out following their own their own momentary interests and, and, and preoccupations. So that's, that's, that's life, you know, but, but let's not get all profound or anything. Um, it's best not to talk of such things. John thinks don't ask, don't tell in the military. Right. Uh, and anyway, uh, Donald Noy farewells John cause he's going off on the ranging, uh, and, um, and tells him to bring back that uncle of yours. So John gets the side quest of find Benjamin Stark. Uh, and someone in the chat suggests that you should go to the subreddit Stannis the Mantis, because some people in the Game of Thrones community believe that Stannis is a insect, a praying mantis. That's how long it's been since the last book, George. It's been eight years. Can you get Winds of Winter before we have to theorize that Varys is a, a cloud mistaken for a man? That that's what's gonna happen next if you don't get that anyway. Um, so uh, he farewells Donal Noy. Sam complains about stairs, and they enter the solar of Lord Commander Gior Mormont. Uh, and the raven, the pet raven that Gior Mormont has, looks at John and says, "Snow." Uh, and of course, you just know that that's actually Blood Raven from his distant cave, walking into the raven uh, and seeing John. Uh, there's some kind of magical shenanigans going on, you know it. Thank you very much for the donation from Robbie C. It is Robbie C.'s birthday. Thank you for spending your birthday, well, probably not the whole birthday, but thank you for taking part in the stream during your birthday. Have a good one. Uh, yeah, name day. We should stay theme, theme consistent, shouldn't we? Anyway, cheers. Uh, so they go into Lord Mormont Solar, and uh, Thorin Smallwood is already in there. Uh, he's a ranger who had been one of Alistair Thorne's allies. So we're reminded that there's still a certain amount of sort of factionalism going on um, in the Night's Watch still. There are still divisions and politics happening. There's never not politics. Uh, and so Thorne Smallwood is basically complaining. He's saying that he should be in charge of the ranging uh, instead, of, instead of Lord Commander Mormont. Um... But Mormont's like, nah, I'm Lord Commander, I'm doing... Oh, oh, he's saying that he should lead the ranging. Um, and your Mormont is saying that, well, I'm going to do it because I'm not dead yet. Uh, and and he thumps his chest and he says, do I look frail? So your Mormont is really sort of trying to make a point by leading this ranging. He's an old man, but he's trying to prove that he's still strong by going out there. But there's certainly an undercurrent of knowing that this is a risk and this is a ranging he might not come back from. I have not died yet, he said. Freud might call that the death drive. Um, generativity versus... Anyway. Um, so uh, so Thorin Smallwood is complaining. Um, and, and, and Lord Mormont is like, yo, I'm not going to send you out beyond the wall 
uh, to look for Ben Stark, to look for Waymar Royce, because that's what happened. Like, Jor Mormont sent Sir Waymar out to track some wildlings, and that's the prologue of book one. And then he sent out Benjamin Stark to go and look for Sir Waymar because he didn't come back. And now Thorin Smallwood is saying, send me to go and look for bloody Ben Stark. But that's like, you know when you get like a ball stuck in a tree and you throw another ball to get the first ball out and it gets stuck in the tree, then you spend another one. Like, you know, like, you know when, you, when you got the bugs in the field, so you get the cane toads to eat the bugs, but then the, the, the toads are a problem, so you, so you get the toad weasels, and then, and then you get the weasel bison to eat all the weasels, um, and, th- and, then, and then the, 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 you know how it goes. Um, so, so Jaws saying, I'm, I'm just, instead of throwing another ball into the tree, I'm just going to climb the fucking tree. I'm going to get Benjamin and Weimar myself. Um, but, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really work in the end, eh? Because Jaw does die. Um, and also Jaw says that Benjamin Stark remains First Ranger. Uh, Benjamin Stark is still technically, he still holds office until we see that he is dead. And in a way, Benjamin Stark is continuing to fulfill the role of First Ranger, because if it's the case in the books, as in the show, that Benjamin is Cold Hands, the mysterious walking corpse, uh, he's described as the Ranger, uh, in the books. He's still ranging around, killing whites and things, so... So maybe he is still such. Although, in the books, there, there is this script where, uh, where George Martin says that Benjamin isn't Cold Hands, which is just annoying, because, like, it would make so much sense if he was. Like, who else is Cold Hands gonna be? Uh, and what else is Benjamin's fate gonna be? But, like, who knows? George Martin keeps his secrets. George Martin is like Smaug. Like, George Martin... Do you say Smaug or Smaug? George Martin is just, like, sitting in his in his castle with all of his treasures. And his treasures aren't riches. I don't think George Martin is a greedy man in terms of finances. He is accused of such. But I think what George Martin is hoarding is secrets. Secret. George Martin told us that secrets are more valuable than sapphire or silvers. Uh, silver or sapphires. I think George Martin is hoarding all these little nuggets of information about his characters, and we won't learn the truth until the dream of spring. Anyway, so Jor Mormont is talking smack, um, and Thorin Smallwood, this ranger, looks angrily at John as though this were all somehow his fault. And you and you probably would be mad. Like if you were a ranger who's been working in the Night's Watch for decades, living in this in this uncomfortable castle with nothing but men and nothing but work and fighting, uh you you're going to be a bit annoyed when some upstart kid, some aristocrat, son of the Lord of Winterfell turns up and starts rising up the ranks faster than you did in decades because John is already uh the steward groomed for command whereas Thorin is being denied advance so you know it, it it is perhaps petty to demand that, that that kind of that kind of you know titles and such but some people are into that shit and it's understandable that he's mad about john um so uh thorin's annoyed and uh and when thorin leaves jaw complains about how much of a doofus thorin is uh and sam is still there and sam is terrified by uh, terrified by Gior because he's just so shy in front of a man of authority, and and Gior kind of fucks with Sam a bit, uh, but event- but Sam stammers and scurries and then eventually leaves. Um, and they talk about the birds, the ravens that Sam is going to ma- uh, to manage. Um, and and Gior sends again. Well, you know, if we do all get butchered out there, I want my I want my uh, my my successor to know when and where. So Jor is very conscious of the possibility of his death, and it also contributes generally to this sense of doom in the North. Like some people say that uh, Game of Thrones is is post apocalyptic. I think it's rather more apocalyptic. Um, there's a growing sense of 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 danger and death and darkness descending on Westeros. Um, doom is coming and that's very apparent in the north uh so sam is is a bit of a scaredy cat and he scurries off uh and lord commander mormont says is he a goddamn fool or what uh, and he also mentions that sam's father is randall tarley and uh who is who is uh high in king renly's council so randall tarley has joined with king renly instead of continuing to support uh joffrey at this point um and 
Law Commander Mormont suggests that he might have sent Sam Tarly to go to King Renly to try to ask King Renly to give the Night's Watch supplies. But uh, he decided not to. George decided not to do that because Sam is so fat and useless that he didn't send him uh, off to King Renly. He didn't think he'd be effective at convincing Renly to give supplies. Um, so instead... So instead, Jean Mormont sends someone called Sir Arnell, uh, because he was one of the Fossaways, who's one, someone from the Reach, who who was uh, someone who worked with Lord Randall Tarly, and so for that reason he sent Arnell to go and ask Renly for support. But we never hear of Sir Arnell again. So So, you know... There are a lot of mysteries in this series. You know, who is Jon Snow's mother? Who is Azora High? Where did the White Walkers come from? Who is Sir Pounce, really? Um, but I think the real big mystery, I think what everyone's really excited to find out in The Winds of Winter is what happened to Sir Arnell? Is he the High Sparrow? Probably. Um, there's a lot of loose ends like that. But anyway, um, so... Yeah, all, all that Jor Mormont wants from King Renly is men, horses, swords, food, supplies. Uh, they need the charity of lords in order to get, uh, in order to survive, the Night's Watch does. And also, Alistair Thorne has been sent to the capital with the White's hand twitching in a jar to try and prove that the White Walkers are real, and that doesn't go anywhere. Uh, and Jor Mormont also mentions his sister, Mage Mormont, and how she reputedly fucks bears, when in actual case she's actually probably fucking torment which is a whole other uh, it, it's actually the best romance story in a song of ice and fire and it's not even mentioned explicitly look it up notes um and joe mormont is expressing skepticism basically he's expressing skepticism about bears and things but he says that well i am skeptical but in a world where the dead come walking because joe saw you know otha otha walking um you know in, in a world where magic shit happens maybe maybe magic's real it's like that moment where Marwyn the Mage in Book 4 go- goes on about how, ah, prophecy's bullshit. Prophecy will bite you in the dick every time. Uh, but still, Marwyn says, there's always this little asterisk, this little foot in the door left to go, eh, maybe fairies are real. Maybe there is magic. Um, and so that, 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 that little skepticism, but doubt with magic continues. Anyway, um, I'll see you, Hadass. Excavate well. Um, so Jor is doing some stuff and he asks how John's injured hand is. Um, and John says that his hand is getting better. It's mottled and it's itching and it hurts, but it's getting better and he can still wield his sword well enough. And he opens and closes his fist, which is an exercise that Maester Amon told him to do uh, in order to make sure his skin heals okay. And he continues that sort of tick of opening and closing his fists for a long time, even after uh, it was necessary. Um, and Amon's a cool bloke, Gior says, and we get some, we, we learn about Amon's backstory. So we're told that Amon is the son of Micah Targaryen, who was the son of Daeron Targaryen, and Daeron was king, and then Micah was king, and then there was this whole, like, succession crisis where, uh, after Micah died, they didn't know who to give the kingship to, uh, we, we meet these characters in Dunk and Egg and, and the, the succession crisis we can talk about elsewhere. Um, oh, it, it is mentioned, though, that, you know, Amon, Amon was named after Amon the Dragon Knight, who was like this famous knight, a, a great fighter. Uh, but Amon, as a kid, a uh, hundred years ago, he had a slow sword, but he had quick wits. He wasn't good at fighting, but he was smart, and that's why he went to the Citadel. And that reminds you of Sam, right? Like, Sam is slow of sword and quick of wit, or maybe not quick of wit, but he... Well, no, he is pretty quick of wit. He's just a little bit anxious and scared, but he's actually pretty good at figuring shit out. Um, and it is just tragic that Sam didn't go to the Citadel, where he so obviously belongs. Um... Anyway, so yeah, Maester Amon is 100 years old, and he knows a lot of shit, and he's got this interesting backstory, where Amon almost could have been the king, uh, but Amon refused, and it instead went to uh, Aegon the Unlikely, who we know as Egg, who we read about in the Duncan Egg short stories. Um, and so, uh, and, and there's a little bit of confusion over Ares, uh, because... Uh, there's an Ares Targaryen who's a different Ares Targaryen to Ares the Second Targaryen, the Mad King, who's that whole other thing. Uh, and so, you know, it actually tells us that Jon is confused by, like, the succession here. And it's funny that George Martin is sort of, you know, explicitly acknowledging that 
uh, the the hereditary and the names and the history and and the and the succession. It is it is confusing uh, in this story. George Martin didn't make this easy for us to follow, uh, partly because he wants it to be like realistic to the story that he's ultimately ripping off, which is the War of the Roses, which is a real uh, feudal conflict that happened in England. Um, so just like real world history, Game of Thrones history is foggy. Um, and so Amon, uh, yeah, Amon refused to be king, uh, and he refused to counsel the king because that was rightly for the gra Grand Maester, and, uh, he didn't want to rule. He said that his duty was to serve, he swore a vow, and would not break it. So that, again, is this whole idea of, like, duty versus love, honour versus your individual interests, and Amon has consistently chosen honour and duty, and you can question whether that's even been good for people. Um, like, if Amon Targaryen accepted the kingship, he probably could have been a great king, right? Like, Amon's a really sort of wise, considerate, careful, wise person, um, who was interested in prophecy, so maybe he would have made a great king, or maybe power would have corrupted Amon. We know that Amon was really into prophecy back in the day, with, like, Rhaegar and such. Maybe Amon would have done some rash, ridiculous things, just like, uh, Aegon the Unlikely, Egg, ended up doing, with the tragedy at Summerhall. Um, so, so maybe Amon did the right thing by sticking to duty. That's one of those central questions explored. Um, and so, and of course it's what Jon struggles with, is between the duty and the Night's Watch and love with Ygritte, and that's sort of what his arc is about in this book. Um, uh, l last book with Jon was sort of about trying to work out who he is a bit, like he decided that, like, yes, I am of the Night's Watch. It was like this sort of teenage thing of like, what is my identity? But now he's sort of really shaping himself into what sort of principles he's following as a man. Uh, does he follow duty? Does he follow his own interests? That's sort of what his conflict's about. Um, and also it's mentioned again that like, you know, the, uh, so after Amon refused to be king uh, and Egg became king, Amon refused to stay at court and advise the king and instead he decided to go and join the Night's Watch. Uh, and apparently the reason why Amon chose to do that was because uh, he thought that if he stayed in King's Landing, uh, Aegon's political enemies would use Amon politically against Aegon in some kind of intrigue, presumably. And I think that's a bit of a bullshit answer. I think that's just an excuse to take Amon to the wall for plot reasons. Because, um, like, surely just as much as Amon could be used against Aegon, Amon could help Aegon, you know, and help protect him and advise him and defend him. Like, I don't know if it necessarily makes sense to go to the wall to protect him. Maybe there's actually another secret ulterior motive. Maybe the real reason why Amon goes and joins the Night's Watch is because he knows that magic and prophecy is, is stronger and relevant out north on the wall. Um, and so maybe Amon actually had other ulterior reasons for going to the wall. I think that's a, uh, that's a distinct possibility, because we know that towards the end of Amon's life, he continues to have a keen interest in prophecy, or at least he does uh, in his final days. Um, but Pete in the chat says that only fuckboys want to be the king. Um, and, and you're damn straight, Pete. Uh, I, think, I think the people who really want to influence things do what, like, Varys does, Littlefinger does, or Lena Tyrell does. Um, it ain't all about thrones despite the the title uh anyway so the raven on mormont's shoulder says king 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 uh and that can be interpreted as evidence of blood raven who is possibly controlling the bird wanting john snow to be king for prophetic reasons uh and uh because because john says oh i think he means for you to have a crown my lord john says to jaw but it might be that the raven was thinking of john instead of jaw uh, and Mormont strokes the raven uh, while his eyes never leave Jon Snow. And that's actually a frustratingly ambiguous sentence, uh, because it could mean that Mormont is stroking the raven, but Mormont's eyes never leave Jon Snow. Or it could mean that the raven's eyes never leave Jon Snow. And if it's the case that it's talking about the raven, that would be much stronger evidence for the idea of this being Blood Raven looking at Jon as king. But if it's just Mormont, it's not, not as strong. But whatever. Um, and so Jor talks a bit more about Amon. Then they talk about how this is relevant to Jon. So we've talked about this conflict between duty and love, and now we connect it to Jon and his brother Rob. Um, because... Uh, Jor talks about like this whole 
jealousy that John must be feeling because they'll garb Rob in silks and satins while John will live and die in ring in ring mail. Uh, you you will have no wife while he will wed a beautiful princess. You will serve while Rob will rule. Um, and this reminds me a lot of Cersei's monologue about her brother Jamie. In just the same way, there's this there's this inter sibling jealousy where Cersei has this monologue where she's like, Jamie got to fight and get respect, and I just had to like serve and be pretty, and and Jamie got power, and I just had to, you know, I don't I only got. Uh, the marriage bed, and, 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 you know, in the same way where these siblings are comparing each other, and John is jealous of Rob's privilege in the same way that Cersei is jealous of Jamie's. Uh, although, unlike Cersei, John pretty much just sucks it up, whereas Cersei, uh, Cersei's resentment runs deep and eventually expresses itself in burning wildfire. Uh, uh, but you know, of course, that's sort of that's 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 drama in it. You got to have some kind of envy, some kind of injustice, some kind of difference as the engine that drives the drama. That's what the stories and all stories are perhaps about. Um, so Jaw really just starkly lays out: this is the conflict, this is the drama between you and your brother. How are you gonna handle that, mate? How are you gonna deal with this level? of of jealousy and difference and bullshit what what are you going to do what kind of person are you what will you do and john's response is i will be troubled and keep my vows which really just like sums john up as a character like john doesn't find it easy to do the right thing he is deeply troubled he hurts and he suffers and he makes mistakes and sometimes he breaks his vows but ultimately, he, he stays true to his, his goals of doing the right thing and trying to protect people and trying to uphold the values of the Night's Watch in the way that his father, well, in these, his uncle Ned Stark taught him to behave. And that is what makes him heroic. In the same way that we can only be afraid, uh, we can only be brave when we're afraid, we can only be honorable when we're troubled. It's only meaningful that we do the right thing. It's only heroic when we found it hard to be heroic and there were better, more tempting options. It's no sacrifice unless you're losing something. And that, in fiction and truth, perhaps is heroism. And that's what it's all about. So thank you so much for listening to the seventh episode of A Clash of Kings Abridged on alt Swift X. This show is a podcast. Uh, there is a link in the first line of the description uh, where you can uh, where you can subscribe to this as a podcast if you'd like to get it in audio uh, instead of as a video. Uh, you can listen to it on the train or while you're working out. There was someone in the chat saying that they, they had to leave the stream to listen to go shower get it on a podcast, play it in your bathroom, you can swift while you shower. Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't... Uh, yeah, it sounds weird to recommend that, actually. Uh, but yeah, so it's a podcast, go check it out. Oh, also... Also, uh, so on this channel, there were also some horoscope videos, uh, which some of you enjoyed. Um, there's now a different channel on which those things live. Uh, if you're interested in the alt swift horoscopes, they now live on a channel called Random Article, uh, and there is a link to that uh, in the live chat right now, and we'll chuck it in the description. Uh, horoscopes, we'll also chuck that in a comment or something. So if you're interested in those horoscope things, uh, you can check them out on that other channel. If you dig it, uh, we'll do a super quick lightning round Q and A. If you want to want to Q to be aid, uh, chuck it in the chat right now. Um, but otherwise, thanks for listening. This was John John One, The Clash of Kings. Uh, this show is going to continue to be uh, infrequent, probably. Uh, but whenever the vibe seems right, we'll do an episode or two. Um, so uh, Swifty Squad has just appeared in the chat. <laughs> Uh, Kenny Arnold says, will Alt Shift X do a face reveal at 1 million subs? I haven't even seen Alt Shift X's face. Alt Shift X is very secretive, uh, and mysterious. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous in, in, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, what's so special about a face? 
uh, here at Ultra Swift X Enterprises. Uh, I mean, you know, if if Ultra Swift X hit a million subs, of course we'd do a face reveal. Obviously, we're not as stuck up as that Ultra Swift X wanker. But yeah, I, I can't speak for Ultra Swift X. I wouldn't know. Um, yeah, Sassy in the chat. Uh, no, we don't have a schedule uh, on this on this Swifty show. It wouldn't really be Swift if we had a schedule. Um, Mark wants to know what do wombat balls taste like? Uh, you know those octopus balls that Japanese restaurants make? What are they called? Can't remember. Tetakiyaki. Oh, wombat balls are very similar to octopus balls, and of course, octopus balls aren't aren't testicles, as far as I know. Um, but uh, but they taste remarkably similar. Uh, someone suggests doing uh, a cocker bridged, uh, not live streamed, but just like recorded then uploaded. Yeah, we might do that. I mean, I think I don't know. It, it's it saves the hassle of having to separately upload it, frankly. Um, and it's kind of fun to do this interaction at the end. Uh, the trick is just not to be too distracted by the live stream. That's that, it can be bad when the live stream is a distraction. Uh, so I think the trick is just not to pay too much attention to the chat, frankly. Uh, Glider says, isn't an octopus just a wet spider? And that's the wisest thing I've heard all day. Um, so with that, we're going to conclude this episode. Have a great day and week and life. Uh, brush your teeth and, um, and check out the podcast and check out Random Article Horoscopes if you dig it. And we'll see you.